Good morning, church. Why don't we stand to our feet? We're going to worship the Lord together. It's a beautiful day outside. We're excited to be in the presence of the Lord. Come on, let's sing. We've come for a move of God. We've come for the Holy One. All we want, all we hunger for is you. We've come with expectant hearts undone, knowing who you are. Lord, we long for what only you can do. Oh, Holy Spirit, come on, fire on the altar, fresh wind blowing through. We're going to stay here until we encounter you. Make us an offering. Make us an upper room. We're gonna stay here until we encounter you. Until we encounter you. Make us desperate. Tear our idols down. We're repentant. This is still your house. And you meant it. When you said you'd pour your spirit out, so we sing, Holy Spirit, come by. Fire on the altar, fresh wind blowing through. We're going to stay here till we encounter you. Make us an offering, make us an upper room. We're going to stay here till we encounter you. Until we encounter you We want to encounter you, Lord Come on, let's sing We need a move of God We need a move of God We need a move of God we need a move of God. We're hungry, we're desperate. Lord, open the heavens. Let's sing. We need a move of God. We sing it out. We need a move of God. We need you, Lord. We need a move of God. We're hungry, we're desperate. Lord, open the heavens. Hey. We we need a move of God. Oh, we need you, Lord. We need a move of God every morning. We need a move of God. We're hungry. We're desperate. Lord, open the heaven. Fire on the altar. Fresh wind blowing through. We're going to stay here till we encounter you. Make us an offering. Make us an upper room. We're gonna stay here until we encounter. Fire on the altar, fresh wind blowing through. We're gonna stay here until we encounter you. Make us an offering. Make us an upper room. We're gonna stay here until we encounter you. We need a move. We're hungry, we're desperate, Lord, oh, come on, let's make that our prayer. We need a move of God, we need you, Lord. We need a move of God, we need you, God. We need a move of God, we're hungry, we're desperate, Lord, oh.
going to sing of the goodness of God. It never fails. It never runs out. Oh, weed and the street, the choice within their hands, as the serpent whispered from beneath, where your grace exceeds the sum of all our lack, for I am Adam, I am Eve. Isn't it just like you to turn it all around? Like only you could, like only you would. You turn it all around for good. And when you do, you do it so it's done for good. Like only you could, like only you would. You turn it all around for good. Oh, Calvary's tree, the nails within your hands. And laughter swept the crowds beneath Where your grace exceeds The sum of all our lack For I'm a thief upon a tree Isn't it just like you To turn it all around for good Like only you could Like only you would You turn it all around and when you do, you do it so it's done for good. Like only you could, like only you would. You turn it all around for good. Isn't it just like you? Oh, it's just like you. Oh, the vast extent of my regrets and all my deepest fears were buried in a garden where you wept and bled in tears. For you climbed a hill not yours to climb. They thought your fate was sealed. For the serpent tried to take you down, but he only bruised your heel. See, the empty grave is overgrown. overthrown and the darkness finally yields so now I don't know a thing to death should ever he appear for death can only borrow breath no longer can he steal isn't it just like you to turn it all around for good like only you Turn it all around for good. And when you do, you do it so it's done for good. Like only you could, like only you would. You turn it all around for good. And the serpent's nowhere to be seen. Where your grace completes the sum of all our lack. For I am Adam, I am Eve. And Eden's my eternity. the king of my heart be the mountain where I run the fountain that I drink from oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the 
I don't know about you, but the Lord's been good in my life. So we're going to sing this out. We're going to celebrate how good he is. Come on, let's sing. You're never going to let, you're never going to let me down. You're never going to let, you're never going to let me down. We sing. You're never going to let, you're never going to let me down. Let's sing it out. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. Definition of good. You are the definition of love, Lord. And we're just. 
just so honored and grateful that we get to know you. Would you continue to move this morning in this place? Move in a mighty way in our hearts today. We love you, Jesus. We ask these things in your holy name. All God's people said, amen. You guys can have a seat. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God said, let us make man in our image. Good morning. How are you guys doing? Good to see you. Hey, uh, we're actually wrapping up our series beginnings today. It's been a, a journey. And so uh, we're going to kind of finish in a way, in an area, in a passage that uh, brings a lot of things together from the beginning of where um, we started in uh, Genesis. And so uh, if you have your Bible this morning, I'd love to ask you to stand as we read God's Word. And if you don't have a Bible, we'd be happy to give you one. It's there in the back. So if you're able to stand, uh, stand with me. We're going to actually spend a lot of time in Joshua chapter 2, but I want to turn to Matthew chapter 1 as we begin uh, this morning. And we're going to read Matthew chapter 1. This is the genealogy of Jesus. And so there's a lot of names in here, but there's one that we want to pay specific attention to. So in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, an account of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham fathered Isaac, Isaac fathered Jacob, Jacob fathered Judah and his brothers, Judah fathered Perez and Zerah by Tamar, Perez fathered Hezron, Hezron fathered Aram, Aram fathered Aminadab, Aminadab fathered Nashon, Nashon fathered Solomon, Solomon fathered Boaz by Rahab. Boaz fathered Obed by Ruth, Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered King David. David fathered Solomon by Uriah's wife, Solomon fathered Rehoboam, Rehoboam fathered Abijah, Abijah fathered Asa, Asa fathered Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat fathered Joram, Joram fathered Uzziah, Uzziah fathered Jotham, Jotham fathered Ahaz, Ahaz fathered Hezekiah, Hezekiah fathered Manasseh, Manasseh fathered Amon. Amon fathered Josiah, and Josiah fathered Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah fathered Shealtiel. Shealtiel fathered Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel fathered Abiad. Abiad fathered Elakim. Elakim fathered Azor. Azor fathered Zadok. Zadok fathered Achim. Achim fathered Eliud. Eliud fathered Eleazar. Eleazar fathered Mathan. Mathan fathered jo Jacob. And Jacob fathered Joseph, the husband of Mary, who gave birth to Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that uh, we get to see just your plan, your sovereign plan in redemption and bringing uh, those who are lost, us, ourselves, back into a right relationship with you through your promises and your covenants, God. And Father, as we read your word and study your word and worship you through your word, God, I pray it would be a pleasing time. I pray, Spirit, you would be our teacher and our guide this morning. Lord, if we come in here with things on our shoulders and just burdens and, and trials, we would uh, cast those upon you and we'd be focused on your word. And Holy Spirit, do only what you can do in our lives and draw us into a greater and deeper dependency of God. Father, we love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys, I have a seat. So as we read through uh, this lineage of Jesus, there's one name that I want to pay specific attention to. Obviously, Jesus is the focus of it, but there's one individual that I want to draw attention to this morning, and that is Rahab. Now, if you know anything about Rahab, you know where we're going, and some of the questions may be asked, but as we consider this lineage, this genealogy of Jesus, we have to ask the question, how could it be that Rahab, the mother of Boaz, having not been born as a member of God's people Israel, Rahab was an Amorite with Canaanite lineage, meaning that, that she was a descendant of Noah's son, Ham, who was cursed because of a sin against his father. Rahab, living in a culture that worshiped false gods, and Rahab, supporting herself and probably her family as a prostitute, could be included in the genealogy of Jesus. Simply, by God's mercy and grace in his sovereign plan of redemption. 
She is no different than you and I. We are all in desperate need of mercy and grace and salvation that comes through Christ. And so when I read things like this, it makes the Bible even more real to me, that it is very transparent and raw. God does not hide the sins of people in Scripture, but He reveals His work in our lives to draw us to a point of salvation in Christ. If you remember what God said to Moses in Exodus 33, 19, God said to Moses, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Paul references these very words of God in Romans chapter 9 and verse 14. He says, what should we say then? Is there injustice with God? Absolutely not. For God tells Moses, I will show mercy to whom I'll show mercy. I'll have compassion on whom I will have compassion. And then Paul said, so then, it does not depend on human will or effort, but on God who shows mercy. See, when Paul was writing these words to the church at Rome, he was speaking to Israel's rejection of Jesus in Romans chapter 9. He shared his burden and his heavy heart for the people Israel from whom the Messiah would come, but yet they would reject him when he came. So much so was Paul's burden for those who rejected Christ that he said, I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the benefit of my brothers and sisters, my own flesh and blood. I wonder how many of us have ever been so burdened and our love for people made in the image of God so great that we would forego our salvation so that they could be saved and have eternal life in Christ. How many of us would cry out to God, save me, having our eyes opened up to the reality of a life apart from God, eternal separation from God in hell, that reality, and yet say, God, I would trade places with them so they could experience what I have. Paul's heart was heavy and burdened. And so when we think of Paul and we think of individuals, we can all probably point to people in our lives like that, that describes that person. But sometimes we, we start thinking like, well, you know what? That's the heart of a missionary, right? That's the heart of a church planter. As our team from Salt Lake City came back spending time with a church planter in Salt Lake City. But I want to challenge each one of us this morning knowing that that should be the heartbeat of every believer because that is the very heartbeat of God. That none would perish, but all have everlasting life in Christ. See, last week we talked about the promise of the Lord not being bound to this world. We talked about how Moses, he's coming to the end of his life, that he could see beyond the temporary. He saw the promise, the eternal promise of God. And we also saw our responsibility of passing on that promise to others. And the example of Moses' relationship with Joshua, of how we are to disciple others and pass that promise on to others. So this morning, we're going to focus on God revealing his promise to the nations, but also our responsibility to proclaim the promise of God to the nations. And so the first thing we want to see here is God reveals his promise to the nations in Joshua chapter 2. In chapter 1 of Joshua, we see the baton of leadership. We talked last week being passed on from Joshua uh, for, to Joshua from Moses. And God giving encouragement to Joshua as the one that God had prepared to lead the people after Moses, to lead them into the promised land. And so we see in, in Scripture the people of God being assembled, the word of God, or the word being sent out to prepare to move the people out of the camp in three days. And then Joshua chapter 2 begins with Joshua secretly sending two spies to scout out the land, especially the area, uh, specifically the area of Jericho. Jericho was a city, part of Canaan. It's located, if you know where Palestine is today, we hear a lot about that in the news. That's the area of uh, Jericho. The city is believed to be the location of the oldest known defensive wall constructed to protect a city. Through archaeological digs and things, they believe this is the place that has the oldest defensive wall. Well, this is the very wall that we see in Joshua chapter 6 that comes down after the Israelites march around Jericho for seven days, enabling the Israelites to enter into Jericho and completely destroy the city. 
And so according to Joshua 2, the spies entered Jericho to scout out the land and report back to Joshua in preparation for the attack that was going to take place a few days later. We are told that in the passage, the spies came to the house of a prostitute named Rahab, where they stayed. And so as this story unfolds in Joshua chapter 2, we have to remember that the land had already been promised to the people by God. And so this wasn't a story about God giving the land and doing the thing. It had already been promised. It did not matter what stood in their way. The land was going to be theirs. The destruction of Jericho was a done deal. And so there's something else for us to see in this story. What we need to see is the glory of God among all the nations. See, every step of the way from Genesis to this point in Joshua, God has been showing his glory to all people through his people by his covenants, by his promises. Many of the covenants we've looked at, we saw the covenant of works in Genesis. At creation, when Adam and Eve would be in eternal fellowship with God as long as they did not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's a covenant of works. But you and I know that they disobey God. They sin against God. And so then we see the covenant of grace, that God did not destroy Adam and Eve, even though he would have been justified in doing so, but instead he promised one who would come that would crush the head of the serpent. And then we get into the flood. We see the Noahic covenant, where God spared Noah and his family from floodwaters of judgment. He promised that he would never again destroy the earth through floodwaters. And it was pointing to the one who would one day come and rescue his people from judgment. And then we see Abraham and the Abrahamic covenant. God promises Abraham, a childless pagan idol worshiper, that he would have a great land, he would have a great nation, he would have a great name, and he would receive a great blessing that would come to him and then to all the families of the earth. We see in this covenant, it's not a covenant based on Abraham's obedience, but it was a covenant and put in place by God's faithfulness, resulting in one's faith being counted to them as righteousness, pointing to the one who would come whose righteousness would be counted to sinners by faith. And then we come to Moses. Here we have the Mosaic Covenant, where God chose a people Israel for himself. He set them free from slavery in Egypt, instituting the Passover, which was a picture of the coming sacrificial lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world by shedding his own blood. It's in this covenant that God gave his law and fulfilled his promise of the great land, the great nation, and the great name, affirming that salvation comes only from the Lord, that it is not dependent on man's obedience or works. And then we didn't get to it, but then the next covenant is the Davidic covenant. While we haven't come to that, we have to understand that this covenant establishes a kingdom from the lineage of King David, which would last forever, leading to the new covenant made in the shedding of the blood of Jesus the Messiah, who willingly gave his life as a ransom for many, thereby fulfilling the promise of God to redeem his people from their sin, from their shame, from their guilt, from their death, and to give them new life through the finished work of Christ. You see, God reveals his promise to the nation through his covenants, even to a prostitute among a people who are going to be destroyed. That's the point of this story. See, God was already at work in the heart of Rahab before the spies arrived. Now, some of you may disagree with me, but I don't believe the spies just happened to stumble upon Rahab. There was something more at work here. The sovereignty of God over the affairs of man was at work. And so in this passage, it indicates that the king of Jericho had been informed. There were Israelite spies that had entered the land, and it appears that people said, we know where they are. They are at Rahab's house. And so they go to Rahab's house, and she says, no, they're not here. Which, in fact, she had hidden them. And so the individuals coming to look left her home and began to search elsewhere looking for them. In Joshua chapter 2, verse 8, it says, Before the men fell asleep, she, Rahab, went up on the roof and said to them, I know the Lord has given you this land and that the terror of you has fallen on us, and everyone who lives in the land is panicking because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to Sion and Og, the two Amorite kings, when you completely destroyed them across the Jordan. And when we heard this, we lost heart, 
and everyone's courage fail because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. And now please swear to me by the Lord that you will also show kindness to my father's family because I have showed kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father, mother, brothers, sisters, and all who belong to them and save us from death. So in this interaction, Rahab confirms the works that God has done. And they were well known about the people, among the people. And the people of Jericho were scared and panicking because of these works. But Rahab has more insight and understanding than all the people in Jericho. You notice what she told the spies? She said, I know the Lord has given you this land. She understands the sovereignty of God. She said, for the Lord your God is in heaven above and on earth below. She recognizes this God, their God, is the one true God. So while all the rest of Jericho just focused on the works, Rahab was focusing on the true God. See, speaking of those who suppress the truth of the gospel, listen to what Paul wrote. He said they're under wrath. In Romans 1.19, since what can be known about God is evident among them because God has shown it to them. And then he said God's revealed himself in his eternal power and divine nature and creation, and all people are without excuse. And so when we consider Jericho, we had people there who were fearful of the works of God, yet they did not submit to him as the one true creator, God, in faith. And since they did not submit to him as the one true God, they would receive the just judgment of their sins. Scripture tells us that Gentiles, non-Jews, were without hope and without God in this world. Well, wasn't Rahab a Gentile? She was an Amorite. Amorites were well known for their sinfulness and child sacrifice. And Rahab was identified as a prostitute. Rahab was just as, just as deserving of God's judgment as all of the rest of Jericho, just as you and I are. Rahab, however, had faith. Rahab had faith that God is God and there is no other. You see, Rahab was able to see beyond the works of God. I mean, they were awesome. They were, they were phenomenal. They were something that, to tell and to hear and to see and to experience. But she was able to look past the works and see the one true creator, God, who in fact had the power and authority over all things necessary to accomplish the works. She had faith because, as Paul said, the gospel is the power of God for salvation, first to the Jew, the Israelite, and also to the Greek, the non-Jew, the Gentile. Paul said in Romans 1.16, for in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. And so when we think about Rahab, it is in this faith that she would be the recipient of God's grace that she would not receive what she justly deserved because of the grace of God, just as all who are followers of Jesus today do not receive the just judgment because we are, in fact, covered by the grace of God. It, we've talked about Hebrews chapter 11 several times throughout this series, and it, it, we point to it as the, um, the chapter that has the heroes of the faith, Right? And so in Hebrews chapter 11, Rahab is actually included in the heroes of the faith. Her name is listed among Abraham and Moses and Noah. And just as a sidebar, Joshua is not listed in the heroes of the faith specifically, but Rahab is. The writer of Hebrews said in 11, uh, chapter 11, 31, by faith, Rahab the prostitute was welcomed or welcomed the spies in peace and did not perish with those who disobeyed. And so what drew this Amorite, Gentile, prostitute to God? The answer is not what drew her to God. The question is who drew her to God? God drew Rahab to himself. See, it is the Holy Spirit that convicts the world of sin and God's righteousness and judgment. Jesus said in John 16, 8, when he comes, the Holy Spirit He'll convict the world about sin, righteousness, and judgment. But Jesus also said it is the Holy Spirit that gives us life. In John 6, 63, the Spirit is the one who gives life. He said the flesh does not help at all, and the words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. And so here's the reality. 
No one understands their need for new life if they do not first understand their condition and judgment. No one understands their need for new life unless they first understand their condition and judgment. And so it is God who is at work drawing people to himself just as he was drawing Rahab. It is well documented that God is still drawing people to himself in cultures that limit the gospel being preached, or in areas where there is no church, there's, there's no Bible, there's no gospel access, there are no believers. In, in his book, uh, The Insanity of God, written by Nick Ripkin, phenomenal book. There's some copies back there on the wall if you would like to get those after service. But in his book, he tells of numerous stories where God revealed himself to people through their dreams. In one instance, a Muslim man named Pramana from a people group of 24 million people spoke and said he found his life in a tailspin. His marriage was horrible. He was heading for a divorce. His children would not obey him. His life was a disaster. This man said that he went to visit the imam who was also a spiritualist. And this imam said, well, here's what you need to do to fix yourself. You need to go get me a chicken. Bring the chicken to me. I will sacrifice the chicken. You go back home and meditate for three days and three nights. And then you'll receive an answer to your problem. On the third night, Pramana said, quote, a voice without a body came to me after midnight saying, find Jesus, find the gospel. Now this man said he did not know who Jesus was. He did not know if Jesus was a fruit or a rock or a tree. But the voice told him to get out of bed, go over the mountain, walk down the coast to a specific city that he had never been to before. And at daybreak, he would see two men. He was to go to those two men and ask them where a specific street was. The two men would take, them to, take him to the street. And when he got to the street, he was to look for a specific house with a specific number on the house and knock on the door and tell the person that comes to the door, I have come to find Jesus. I have come to find the gospel. And so he does this. He has no hope in things in this world. And so he follows the leading of this voice. He knocks on the door and a man opens the door and Pramana said, I have come to find Jesus. I've come to find the gospel. And the man looked at him and said, you Muslims must think I am a fool that I would fall for this trick. And Pramana began to share with him and said, I don't know if you're a fool or not, but I've come to find Jesus and I've come to find the gospel. And the man invites him into the house. That man was one of three known believers among 24 million people. Pramana needed Jesus, but he didn't know how. Now, we hear things like this, and we think, this is crazy. But I can tell you from personal experience, it happens. I've told you guys a story before of going to a woman's house in a village in Moldova and knocking on the door, and she opens the door and looks at me and says, I've been waiting for you to come and tell me how to be saved. It's crazy, Right? Is it any more crazy that an Amorite prostitute declares to two Israelite spies who are determined to come in and destroy her city, and she says, I know the Lord has given you this land, and the Lord your God is the God of heaven above and heaven and on earth below? Show kindness to my family and save our lives? God makes his name known among the nations. God had been working in Rahab's heart, leading her to true faith. But we have to notice something else here in this story. God sent messengers to her to confirm this faith. And so our second point is that our responsibility is to proclaim the promise of God to others. You see, aside from Rahab and possibly her family, the people of Jericho, they really knew absolutely nothing about God. They'd heard reports of God, a God who did miraculous things for a group of people but they did not know him as the Lord of heaven and earth. God revealed this to Rahab. But would she have truly understood the full promise of the coming Messiah? I don't believe so, and I don't think Scripture tells us so unless someone told her. You see, the spies stepped into her world, and through this interaction, Rahab became part of the people of God. 
She became the wife of Salmon, the mother of Boaz, the grandmother of Obed, the great-grandmother of King David, who was the grandfather to and a foreshadowing of the coming king, Jesus. In verse 14 of Joshua 2, the men answered her. The spies said, we will give our lives for yours. If you don't report our mission, we will show kindness and faithfulness to you when the Lord gives us the land. And in verse 18, it said, when we enter the land, you tie this scarlet cord to your window through which you will let us down. Bring your father, mother, brothers, and all your father's family into your house. Now, there's been a lot of discussion and many ideas regarding, regarding the importance of this scarlet cord. One, one idea says that this symbolizes the blood of the Passover lamb that covered the doorposts of the Israelites in Egypt. We can't really be certain if that is the reality, but what is clear is that this act of obedience sets Rahab and all those who are in her home apart from the rest of Jericho, which will be destroyed. You see, if the spies had not come and given the instructions, Rahab very well could have known a little bit about God, but still perished because no one went to her with instructions on how to escape judgment. What we find in Joshua chapter 6 is Joshua gives the commands of the people, march around the city. On the seventh day, they march around the city. They were instructed to shout for the Lord and shout that the Lord had given them the city. And Joshua said that they were to destroy everything. When he said everything, he meant everything. <laughs> Nothing was to be alive in that city except for Rahab and the people in her home. See, when the city was taken, these two spies went to Rahab's house. They got her and her family, and they settled them outside the camp of Israel. And in verse 25 of chapter 6, the passage says that Rahab continued to live in Israel. Those who have received God's mercy and grace and have been saved in Christ have a responsibility to go and proclaim the promise of God to others. That salvation is available only in Christ that we must put our faith and our hope and our trust in Jesus to be rescued from judgment. See, the family of God does not just include people of Israel or the people of Israel. It doesn't include people that just look like you and I look. The family of God consists of all who have been saved by faith in Christ. I love the picture of Revelation 7, 9, when John said, I looked and there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. People who deserve judgment from every nation, tribe, and language, from every ethne, every people group, who God has drawn to himself and obedient followers of Jesus proclaim salvation. I think way too many Christians look at the commands such as given in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, the Great Commission, and think this is only speaking of those who have the gift of evangelism or have been called as missionaries. That mindset is a selfish misunderstanding. Matthew 28, 18 through 20 is a command given to all followers of Jesus. Now, Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teach them to observe everything I have commanded you because I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Acts 1.8 is also very clear about the mission that you and I have been given and called to. In Acts 1.8, Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You know, the early disciples, they understood this. They left Jerusalem. They took the gospel to the ends of the earth. You and I are beneficiaries of their obedience today. Paul understood this as he traveled and planted churches all over the region. And countless numbers of obedient followers of Jesus have gone where they have been led to go by the Holy Spirit, whether that is down the street or around the world. Why? To proclaim the promise of God to someone that the Holy Spirit is already convicting of sin and God's righteousness, to point them to salvation. And so while God is revealing his promise to the nations, Paul asks a great rhetorical question in Romans chapter 10, verse 14. Paul said, how then can they call on him they've not believed in? 
How can they believe without hearing about him? How can they hear without a preacher? It's not a preacher, it's a proclaimer. And how can they proclaim, preach, unless they are sent? It's written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. God, there's a lot of beautiful feet in here. You and I have been sent with the message of hope that the local body of believers is made up of ambassadors for Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 provides an expected call to action for you and I to engage the world with the gospel. Because as followers of Jesus right now, you and I know what life is like apart from Christ. You and I know the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ. You and I know what it means to cross over from death to life in Christ. You and I know what it means to have hope in Christ. You and I know what it means to have the promise of eternal inheritance that we received in Christ. You and I know what it means to be a co-heir with Christ. You and I know that this is not our home, but there are billions of people who do not. Billions. And because we know and they do not, and because we fear the Lord, Paul says, then we try to persuade people to Christ. Paul said it is the love of Christ that compels us to go and proclaim salvation. The salvation is only found in the one who died and was raised to give us life. Church, we have a lot of, lot of different things going on. We have a lot of ministries we point to. But guys, the greatest ministry of all has been given to us by God. And it must be the intentional focus of everything we do. And that is a ministry of reconciliation. God is reconciling the world to himself. 2 Corinthians 5.20 Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us, and we plead on Christ's behalf. We plead with people, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin become sin for us, so we may become the righteousness of God in him. I find it very telling we do not know the names of the spies that went to Rahab. There's some who speculate, but Scripture doesn't reveal their names. You know what that tells us? We don't go to make a name for ourselves. We go to make the name of Jesus known. A quote that I am reminded of often was from Count Zinzendorf, where he says, preach the gospel, die, and be forgotten. And so we must go. And they go, go where? Wherever the Holy Spirit's leading you. We must go. Like, to who? Whoever the Holy Spirit is leading you to. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, famously said, and it's quoted by Richard Blackaby, find where God is at work and join him. Well, how do we do this? Very simple. You just make yourself available. And you put your yes of obedience on the table. Because God is at work all around us. Train yourself to seek opportunities, to see every opportunity, every interaction, every relationship, every day, to see what God is doing. And say, God, I'll join you in that. God will guide you where he wants you to go to proclaim his promise to others. He sent the spies. He'll send you. I'm closing. I wonder how many of us are sitting here right now that God might be speaking to. Maybe God's revealing himself to you for the very first time this morning. Or maybe he has been revealing himself to you and you came this morning. He's revealing his promise of salvation to you. He's drawing you as he drew Rahab 
to a decision of repentance and faith in Christ. If that's the case, you confess your sins and declare Jesus as Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead, the scripture says you'll be saved. You'll be saved. Maybe today is the day when the message of the gospel has been made very clear to you. That we all deserve judgment. We all deserve eternal separation from God because of our sin. But God in his great mercy sent Jesus himself to live a perfect life, to die on a cross, to be buried and raised from the dead three days later to give us eternal life in him. What about others around us? What ELL student is God at work in their lives? What upward player or family member has God at work in their lives? Now, we have a lot of individuals participating in the largest um, alumni softball tournament in the country today. What individual in Grove City is God working in their life? We look to central Ohio, Columbus, where we live. The nations are here. What Muslim, what Hindu, what Sikh is God working in their lives? What individual in Mexico or Pakistan or Latvia or Jamaica, Columbus, Salt Lake City, West Virginia, what classmate, what coworker, what family member? Who is God revealing his promise to? Guys, you and I will not know unless we go. We will not know unless we go. That's what the story of Rahab's all about. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for the promise that we see in Scripture of salvation that has been made available through Christ. The promise from the very beginning. Your covenant of grace that you would come and step into our world, step into our lives to give your life as a ransom for many. And Father, as we think about our own lives, maybe some of us here this morning, you've been drawing them to you. And today is the day that they surrender their life to you and find salvation in Jesus Christ. For many of us who call ourselves followers, Lord, give us a burden. Give us the love for people. Give us the burden that Paul had. That we would want people so much to know Jesus that if we could, we would trade places with them. God, we love you. We love your gospel. We love the promises that we see in Scripture. We love how you have laid the work of redemption from the very foundation at creation. Lord, do what you need to do in our lives. Open our eyes to see you at work around us and use us for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.
to God. Amen. Hey, uh, it's been a great morning. Appreciate you being here today and uh, hopefully God is beginning to work in your lives. Maybe spirit leading you to some places that you need to go. Um, we have a lot of different opportunities. We have school supplies. There's bags in the back to fill those things up. Uh, we have Upward coming up. Still need individuals to come and to help share the gospel with over a thousand people every Saturday here for about two and a half months. We have our ELL ministry where we to reach the nations with the gospel. They're coming here and God's sending them here. They need people to serve and to serve in the kids ministry and to serve these people well. And uh, today after uh, at 5.30, we have a uh, meeting for anybody interested in going on our Mexico mission team. We'll be in a conference room right back here at 5.30. Hope to see you there. And next week, uh, Pastor Mark and I believe the mission team from Utah are going to share a little bit what God did uh, there this past week. And so you want to come back and hear that. 
that. So um, with that, guys, let's pray, and uh, we'll go out and do what God calls us to do. Lord, we thank you for today and be able to come together and to worship you corporately, Lord. Father, work in our lives as you want. Um, just help us to fulfill the purpose that we have in Christ, that you have saved us for a reason, and that is to know you, to worship you forever, but also to go and tell others about the hope that is in us, God. So send us out of here with that burden. In Jesus' name, amen.